Hi, everybody. Uh, my Twitter handle is up here. It's at Carrie Girls with one R. If you guys are tweeting, I would love to see your comments on, on the presentation. I'm going to talk about the things that people do that turn people off in social media. And this is from six years of managing social media presences and seeing almost everything, I think. So um, without further ado, I always like to start out my presentations by saying my name's Carrie and I'm a social media addict. Um, because I really think in order to be successful and to know how to talk to people in social media that you need to be a user yourself. And you need to be a user of any of the platforms that you're working on yourself too because they're all different. This is a quote uh, that I'll read it to you guys that showed up on our Facebook wall in January of 2010, almost two years ago now. It says, I just got a keychain and address labels in the mail from you guys. Now that I see you posting on Facebook and I know you're legit, I'll be sending you a donation. Thanks for the work you do. So we got a kick out of this, but this person was serious. So, um, you know, the way that people communicate and the way that they interact with brands, nonprofits, businesses, Companies, everything is really changing. So a little background about social media at HSUS. Uh, social media, our program includes Facebook, Twitter, our online community, which is the login portion of our website, um, our online volunteers, and mobile. Last April, we uh, hired a mobile communications manager. We actually repurposed a, a position that, um, that we felt we needed mobile for more and brought this person in, and it was one of the best investments that we've ever made in our uh, emerging media program. If you are not thinking about mobile, this presentation is not about mobile, and I know there's others that are, you absolutely should be thinking about mobile and how it affects your business. Um, we do have, full disclaimer, we have six full-time staffers in social media. That includes online advertising, social media, and mobile, though. Um, and we have an in-house intern. Interns are a godsend when it comes to social media. I don't recommend you let them run your social media program, but pay them and give them the learning experiences and help you manage the day-to-day -day and administrative tasks that go along with social media management. And we have four office dogs. You'll see my dog quite a few times in this presentation, obviously. Um, we have a new position opening. Actually, we just filled it in 2012 for what we call enterprise-wide social media management. So we have our HSUS fan page, and it's pretty big at this point. Um, but we have over 100 what I call ancillary presences. And this is unique to big, bigger corporations, bigger nonprofits. Um, but that means over 100 people that manage a social media presence in the organization. Uh, that has the HSUS brand on it. And so that's a really big, big network. Um, so we're hiring, we, hi we just hired somebody to help us manage that and manage the brand consistency across all of those platforms. Uh, we focus 70% of our time on Facebook because that's where our constituents are right now. We surveyed our email file, asked them what networks they were on, and we also looked at our sharing data. So what, what people were sharing and where they were sharing it we found that the majority of our constituents, our members, our donors, our, uh, the people who take action on our issues, are on Facebook primarily. Uh, we raise about $200,000 annually on Facebook. That is not normal. Um, that is thanks to having great executive buy-in uh, so that we have the resources to do these things. Um, and a, a slew of other factors. Um, so that that's one of our uh, unique success stories. Our Facebook network includes an official HSUS fan page, and uh, it's actually 100 other presents, since I mentioned that, and over 100 staffers that manage uh, Facebook presence for the organization. But to note, it's a really small part of their job. Um, and so we have this, you know, merging media department that handles the social media strategy for the organization. But it's also our responsibility to teach the other people throughout the organization the best practices that we know and that we look at every day. Uh, we use Twitter primarily as a customer service and relationship building uh, piece, and that's how Facebook and Twitter differ for us. We found that our constituents are not on Twitter, but people talk about us on Twitter. So it's important for us to be there and be a part of the conversation. People complain a lot about our address labels and our mail frequency and things like that. Um, if you're on our mailing list, you know what I mean. So um, it's, you know, it's important for us to be there and help people rectify those issues, even if they're not specifically our problem. And I'll get into that a little bit more. 
I mentioned our constituents are on Facebook, but not on Twitter. And everything we do online is tied to advocacy and fundraising, and social media is no different. There's just this added customer service, um, positive sentiment about the brand uh, kind of metrics that, that we add to it. So our Facebook structure looks like this. It's not hierarchical. In, in necessarily we have the HSUS fan page which has over a million members now so it's a very active page and then we have all of these different branches so we have campaigns that have uh, Facebook pages we have um, states that have different Facebook pages some individual campaigns have Facebook causes and that's a platform that nonprofits use to raise money on Facebook and then we have affiliates we have like an international arm Humane Society International which operates under the HSUS umbrella, but they're actually a separate organization. But we're also responsible for helping them and, and communicating best practices and, and helping them with, with their social media presence. So our social media strategy, it's not some 10-page document that nobody can understand. It's really these simple things. The first is be where people are. So when a new network pops up, uh, or, or a new technology pops up, we are immediately on top of it and looking to see if we can find a way to make it work for our goals and our brand. Um, so that includes staying on top of the latest trends. So I want to show you very quickly who's on Pinterest. Yes, women. <laughs> Pinterest is good. Well, Pinterest is about 81% women right now. Um, so that's why I make that joke. But it was important for us to be on Pinterest because our constituency matches that. It's 55 and older women. So our demographics are in line with the demographics of Pinterest, and that's why it's important for us to be there. So you can see where you know we put together a strategy. We have this working group, and, and we're trying to figure out how it's going to work for us. But one thing we think that, uh, that it'll do for us is help us put out our DIY stuff. We have DIY bird feeders and dog treats and doggy birthday cakes and like all this stuff I didn't even know we had on our website, but it's perfect for this site. Um, we also put have a board called Products I Love, which uh, showcases things that we like around the web, but also sneaks in some of our favorite online store items too. Um, and so, you know, we're, it, it, this is a very new uh, platform, but one thing you need to know is that it reached 10 million unique visitors, unique users, faster than any internet property on the web. So if your demographics match uh, Pinterest's demographics, then it's something you should probably take a look at. Uh, I could talk about Pinterest all day, but I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Um, let me get full screen again. Okay, so uh, the next thing is research new opportunities that goes along with that. What we do is every day we read a uh, couple of nonprofit publications, and I'll give you a couple of them. Mashable is one, even though um, their feed is ridiculous with all of the articles they provide now. Um, and so it's, it's probably a good idea to just get a digest and read, skim through the headlines and read what, you, what you're interested in. So Mashable is a, a basically a social media blog. Um, I also like Reagan PR. They've been putting out some really great articles lately about strategy and about social media crises, which Amanda just talked about, and I'll get into some of that too. Um, we have been through at least a dozen social media crises on uh, Facebook in particular. Uh, train staff and have guidelines. This is very important. If you were in the last session, you know why this is important. But full disclaimer, we don't even have a social media policy, and we have 800 employees. That's because we can't get our social media policy out of our legal department. <laughs> if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me say that, and I say it every time because we still have that problem. So the way we get around it is we hold monthly privacy training uh, webinars for our staff. And that way we're communicating good ideas, common sense, best practices to them without having a formal written policy that we have to get approved, disseminated through HR, all of that. But it is our responsibility, I feel at least, to, uh, to communicate these things to our employees because that's what we do. We work in this space every day. Uh, take an integrated approach. Social media is not a silver bullet to selling, uh, getting people to donate, any of that stuff. It needs to be a part of your overall uh, website, email, mobile, even print efforts, all of your advertising efforts. Um, for, in order for, for it to be as successful as it can be, it needs to be a part of all of that. Um, measure everything. There's a myth out there that social media isn't measurable. I definitely think it is. You just need to know why you're there. For us, I mentioned we're trying to get people to take action, donate, 
We're trying to increase positive sentiment about the brand, um, and that's basically people having positive conversations about their interactions with us and their experiences with us. Um, and customer service. Customer service is why we are on Facebook. The other stuff comes later once people feel a connection with us and trust us. Uh, learn from others and adapt. Um, you know, uh, one reason why we read all these articles is because we learn from other people's mistakes and try not to do them ourselves. Um, and so it's important, I think, to learn from others in your industry, others that are doing social media really well, and um, learn from what they're doing on both a positive and a negative level. Get executive participation. This is, I mentioned, one of the biggest you know, secrets to our success is the executive buy-in that we got when we first started. Um, I literally sat down in our CEO's office and taught him how to use Facebook and, and set his privacy settings for him. And uh, our COO, he's on Twitter, and we taught him how to use Twitter, and the joke is that he tweets more than the Humane Society account does because he loves it. He loves that, that being involved and being in the know and all of that. And he does it on his phone. It's not like he's chained to his computer. I think that's why he likes it. Um, but that ground that we laid in the very beginning is why when I go to them and say, I need more staff, I need more resources, we want to take a risk. We don't know if this is going to work, it may flop, but you know, they're more willing to allow us to do that because they get it. They get how it works, why it's important, they get all of that. Showcase successes is a part of that executive participation. I get in front of our uh, board of directors once a year in our, our fundraising council and talk about the successes that we've had in social media. And it's not just raising money. If you're not raising money or, or generating sales in social media, you know, that may be a part of your goals, but that's not everything. These customer service turnarounds that people are making, Amanda showed a couple of those, trying to rectify problems and turning a bad experience with the brand into a positive one is absolutely something you should be showcasing to the people who make the bigger decisions. Um, listening is, I think, the first step in social media. If nothing else, you should have Google alerts for your brand name, people who are important in your organization, uh, any acronyms that you have, any campaign, big, big campaigns that you're working on. And then uh, to, uh, Twitter has a, a couple of different services that you can use. We like to use TweetDeck. We're just very, very in love with TweetDeck at our organization. But there's also a service called TweetBeep that will email you mentions of your brand on Twitter. Now, the focus that we put on Twitter is because, at least in my opinion, Twitter is the most real-time account that you have of what people are saying about you. And so it's important to find a tool that works for your management style to know what people are saying about you there. The next is be transparent and respond to everyone. I get chastised for this all the time, but we respond to every single inquiry that comes in to us via Facebook and Twitter, as long as it's a legitimate question or concern. So if people write a comment on our page, um, they're just kind of you know letting their opinion be known, we might not respond to them. But if they voice that comment and say, what do you think about this or what are you going to do about this, we're responding to them within two hours on Facebook. It's a really high expectation. It depends on what your expectations are. Um, but, you know, we, Amanda gave a great example earlier of a um, person who wrote into the hospital and, and, like, the kid had hit his head and they were tweeting, asking what they should do. That happens all the time to us, too. That's why it's important to listen and to respond. Somebody actually wrote on our Facebook page that they hit a dog on the side of the road. And what should they do? That's the first thing you thought of that was to write on our Facebook page. I was so frustrated. I was like, yeah, go ahead, call somebody, you know? Like, calm down. And I said, and the same thing she said, while I am not a doctor, and I said, while I am not a veterinarian, you need to call your veterinarian or an emergency pet hospital ASAP or animal control or something like that. That is why it's so important to listen. Don't be afraid to fail and learn from mistakes. We have made so many mistakes in social media. Here's one of them. I'd like to share it with you. Um, so we saw this contest on Facebook that was $10,000 for your favorite charity if you got your, your fans to vote for you. And we were like, oh, we have 100,000 Facebook fans now. We totally got this in the bag. So we posted and said, hey, vote for us for your favorite charity, and we'll use the money 
to uh, put it towards our animal rescue team that goes out during disasters and helps animals. So everybody's all jazzed about it. They're like, oh, this is so easy. I can't wait to be, you know, part of this. Like, I don't have to give money, but I can be a part of this just by casting my vote. All it took was one fan to say, to do a little bit of homework and say, did you know that this company profits from bullfighting? We're the Humane Society. Like, that is not acceptable. So, um, so we immediately looked into it, verified the claim. The person was right. And we posted immediately and said, we, we've withdrawn from this contest. We're sorry we didn't investigate this further. We will investigate these kind of things further in the future. Thank you for paying attention. And the comments that followed that, there were a couple that were like, you should have known better, you know, and all that. But the overwhelming majority was like, thank you for being honest. And that's what this person says here. I love the honesty. We should have investigated. We made a mistake, period. Taking responsibility, thank you. Um, and so that's another reason why it's important to always be listening and to do your homework. So we learned from that. So here's the problem. Too many marketers, and, and I define marketers as people that are using social media right now, are treating the Facebook like the Twitter follow as a measure of success. So we've got a million, 190,000 fans on Facebook. That's a lot. Um, and we were excited to hit the million fan mark. I mean, that's a huge milestone. But that does not equate to success in social media anymore. It's no longer about how many friends you have. That was a total MySpace thing. Um, and so, you know, it's, the point is that this is the start of the relationship that you make with these fans, uh, not the end. Once, you, once a lot of companies get, you know, 100,000 fans, 200,000 fans, a million fans, they're like, done, we're, we're, we, we're awesome. But there are so many things that, uh, why this is wrong. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through those, at least in my opinion right now. Um, so I think that success is no longer about how many friends you have. The real question is, do your fans do what, they, what you want them to do, what, what you are on Facebook for? And um, it's what happens after the like that matters. How are you going to engage with these people so that they'll come back to your page? And that repeat visit after a like is not very common. Um, and so it's important for you to think about how you're going to retain those people once you get them on your page. And so here are some ideas for acquiring likes and followers, how you're getting these people on your page. You may be doing some of these, you may be doing none of these, and here are some suggestions for you. Um, the first is incorporating share tools on your website and your email. Every email and every website page that you have should have at least a share on Facebook and share on Twitter icon. And so advertisers use that to target you. So if you've got the keywords animal welfare or humane society supporter in your profile, you will see an ad for our fan page because you are the specific person that we are looking to bring onto our page and to show all of the great things that we do. And hopefully by getting engaged in all of that on our page, you will feel connected enough with us to donate or uh, take action when we ask you to. So I think that while you shouldn't be buying all your fans, because that's, I, don't, I just don't agree with that, I think a small part of your acquisition efforts having uh, Facebook ads is helpful. It's really worked really well for us. Um, tagging others in posts. This is simple relationship building on Facebook, but you can tag another fan page in a uh, Facebook post. Recently, the other day, we got some really great news that a food service company decided to ban gestation crates, which are really small crates that pregnant pig, pigs live in. And we, we uh, tagged them in the post that said, you know, thank you so much to Bon Appetit Management Company for phasing out gestation crates. Um, it's, a, it's another win for animals. We tagged them in the post, and what we saw was our fans would click on that and go over to their page and say thank you for adopting this animal welfare policy. And they see that, and they see that we're sending people over there. The post also shows up on their page, and it's good for relationship building. And then other people see you know, uh, that you're doing that, and you become more visible on Facebook. Participating as your page elsewhere on Facebook, I'll give an example of this in a bit, but um, you can, there is a button on the top right-hand side of your fan page, if you have a fan page, which you absolutely should have a fan page if you are a business, not a profile, not a group, none of that. Um, if you have a fan page, there's a, a little button that says, use Facebook as carry. And so I can click on that, 
and toggle between use Facebook as Carrie and use Facebook as the Humane Society of the United States. And I can go around Facebook and comment on content across Facebook as the Humane Society of the United States. So what we did, uh, another example with the, with the same situation I was talking about before, we went on Bon Appetit's Facebook page because they had posted an article about the news, and we always said was thank you so much for caring about animals. And that was from the Humane Society of the United States, and it was good for relationship building and, and to keep us visible as well. An obvious one is retweeting other people on Twitter. If you go to our Twitter feed, you'll see that it is probably 70% at replies and retweets because our feed is for engagement and it's for customer service and so we are listening to everybody writing people back and retweeting people um, so that we can continue that relationship building ask people to retweet and share your content it is amazing how many more people will share something if you just ask them to so on Facebook or on Twitter you'll see a lot of people say great news for animals or something like that P please retweet or on Facebook please click the share button or the like button Yesterday, our post on Bon Appetit actually said, click like if you think this is a good step for animals. That post got 4,000 likes on it. So you will get more people to actually take the action that you want them to do if you ask. Um, integrating social efforts into your website and email, I mentioned this before, um, it's not just about the sharing. If you go to our homepage on any given day, and let's say we've got an event coming up, like a, an awards event, um, there will be an article on the website about that event, but there will also be a link to RSVP to that event on Facebook. And so that kind of integration is really important um, for maintaining that visibility. Re speaking of events, I think events are one of the most underutilized features on Facebook because it takes people online and gets them to real life events, usually. They're mostly, they're, they're real life events. Um, and so replicate all of your events on Facebook and establish Twitter hashtags before you, you start an event. Like this event today, if you are on Twitter, then you knew from all of the documentation and the website and everything that there's a specific event hashtag for this conference. That stuff should be established well before in advance so that you can let your members know that if you're tweeting, use this hashtag. And then connect with your existing friends and coworkers and partners and vendors and just let them know you're on Facebook. Now, we need to remember a few things. Businesses and organizations have caught on to the miracle of Facebook. Facebook was not designed for, for nonprofits like me and businesses like you. It just wasn't. People got on Facebook to connect with their friends and family. And so the problem that we're having is that people's news feeds are getting inundated with brand messaging, and they're missing a lot of what their friends and family are doing. And that's, I mean, they connected you to you for a reason, but if you are constantly in their feed, clogging up their feed, then there's a problem. We realized back in August of last year, we were posting four times a day on Facebook, and our unsubscribe rate was higher than our growth rate. And we were like, why? Um, well, <laughs> we looked at the statistics, which Facebook gives a very great, very comprehensive statistics, and we realized that it was because we were posting too much. So that's the kind of thing that you need to find a comfortable way to decide what's too much. We post once a day, never once, more than once a day unless there's breaking news. Um, we leave out one day of the week, so we post four times a week. For our affiliates and the smaller campaigns that have Facebook page, pages, it's two to three times a week. So that's our gauge. That may be different for you, though. Um, so people are getting inundated with this branded messaging. People didn't join Facebook to connect with your order business. They joined because of their friends and family. And it is so easy to hit the like button, but it's also easy to hit the unlike button or the hide button. And so you really need to be careful and pay attention to those statistics to see if people are hiding you hiding your posts, hiding you completely, or unliking you. That stuff's very easily found in, in Facebook's analytics. Um, the point is that you must be relevant, interesting, concise, responsive, and provide value to your fans. Yes? Yes, you can. That is an, the insight. It actually breaks it down, too. Because you can um, see this is a post on our fan page and you can click the person can click the X here and hit hide this post or hide all by the Humane Society they can also do that in their news feed which is where it happens the most yes yeah mm -hmm. and Facebook breaks it down by where they hid you and, and all of that we um, 
speaking of memes, you guys know that that six box meme that's going on Facebook by now. It says what my friends think I do, what my mom thinks I do. That we posted one of those the other day. It was it was for a cat, and it was the, the same. The cat was doing the same thing in all the photos, so that's the humor of it. Um, we posted that on our page. It got four thousand likes, but it also got a thousand unsubscribes. So people, the, some people loved it. But it got more unsubscribes than any post we've ever done. So that was a learning experience for us. It, it, to, or, or just let that meme is just like so tired, I guess. People, we did it a little late, to be honest. But, um, but the point is, like, likes are great, but unsubscribes are awful. So you need to pay attention to those numbers. So perhaps the most important lesson, I think, is to think like a Facebook user. And this goes back to my original point of you've really got to, you've got to be a Facebook user in order to communicate with Facebook users. Um, and so here's what you shouldn't do. Some of these mistakes are mine. Some of them are other people. Um, mistake number one, you're posting too much. If you post five times a day and you're all I see in my newsfeed, I'm going to unlike you. You're just not that important. Um, so this is an example of, um, of the statistics that, that Facebook gives. And you can see uh, the blue line is new likes, the, the green line is unlikes. Obviously, you want those things to be very far apart. That's how you tell, though, um, how, how people are, un are liking you and unliking you. Question? Well, I think looking at these statistics is one way because if you see a pattern, because Facebook will show you how many times you posted per day and uh, among other <coughs> metrics, you know, it could be the type of post. If you see a real big spike in unlikes and you go back to that day and you see that it was um, maybe you were, uh, we do this technique where we do fill in the blank. So we say, my pet's funniest habit is blank. And people, people comment on that. It, say we did that uh, every Friday for three weeks and we noticed that our unsubscribe rate skyrocketed on Fridays. We could pretty much tell that that's why. Because there was no other thing that we did differently. Um, and it is really, I think, all about what you're posting. So look at what you're posting and how it correlates to your unsubscribe rate. Yes, I do, I do. Um, I think that you should be looking, going to your page every single day and monitoring it, getting rid of commenting policy, policy violations, and I'll go into, I'll show you guys our commenting policy in a little bit. Um, but I think starting out, if you post at least once a week so that when people do come to your page, it's not stale, but it's not overkill, and then you increase the, the uh, frequency as you get more fans so you can get more data about what people like. Um, I think that's smart to start off slow instead of starting off big and then annoying the hell out of everybody. We did that. <laughs> yes. Are you an admin of your Facebook page? Okay, so if you, any admins of a Facebook page, when you go to that Facebook page, there will, it's called Insights, and it'll be on the left-hand navigation. It's also, there's a link on the right-hand, too, but that's what it's called. It's called Insights. And then that will go into a whole sea of analytics. So you've got to really spend some time in there to figure out what, where everything is. So mistake number two is that you're posting too little. So everybody's like, well, what, what am I supposed to do, right? Um, if I come to your page and the last time you posted was months ago, I'm not going to like you. I'm bored already. And that's why I say a w once a week when you're starting out, I think, is good. And then you can see how your audience is responding to people. I do think it's different for every single brand. This is an example of our Louisiana Facebook group. It was a group back then. And I took this screenshot in 2011, and the last time anybody posted was September 21st, 2010. That is unacceptable. Um, and so you really need to figure out what the frequency is best for you. Can I just yes, absolutely. Can you just go to oh, duh. Good point. Mistake number three is all you do is talk about yourself. If I come to your page and all you're doing is self-promoting, I see right through you. Play nice with others. Um, so here's an example of, of something we did. We, we are very good friends with a group called Dog Bless You. 
and they match veterans with service dogs. And of course, we're all about that. Um, and so we did a post uh, on our page for them. We tagged them. Um, they were doing a promotion where the number of likes, they would give away something. I'm going to be honest, like, you all need to be careful about that kind of technique, and I'll get into promotional guidelines soon. Um, but we love these people. And so we posted on behalf of them because we thought our fans would really like that. And they could see that we were not talking about ourselves all the time. Mistake number four is your page is not for text. I'm a Facebook user. I don't read. If I come to your page and it's nothing but status updates, they're four lines long, they don't have any photos or text to break it up, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take the time to read any of that. So this is an example of the Humane Research Council, also friends of ours. I've given them this feedback. Um, this is their, their Facebook page. It is nothing. First of all, it's automated posts, which are a no-no, and I'll get to that too. Um, but it's nothing but text. That is very boring. I would never take the time to read any of that, even though what they have to say is very interesting, especially in my industry. Um, and so you really want to break up the type of posts that you do. Photos do really well on Facebook. Facebook is making them more prominent with the new timeline feature. And so you really want to make sure that you're breaking that those types of posts up. Yes, we do have the best photos, so there's no excuse for us. <laughs> um, mistake number five is all you do is sell, sell, sell. If your page feels like a used car lot, no offense to any used car lot uh, people out there, and all you do is push your product, ask for donations, I'm going to unlike you, that's not why I'm on Facebook. Um, and so I think, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, this was a tactful way to push a, a sales promotion. What we did was we had this Father's Day promotion on our online store um, for these t-shirts for dads. And the dog father and cool cat dad. Um, I don't know if I would buy them, but um, they're very popular. And um, what we did instead of saying buy these t-shirts was we gave some away. And we did it via a mobile SMS text message promo. And so we said, you know, text dad to 30644 for a chance to win these cool t-shirts. Contest sends on this day. Then check out our Happy Father's Day tab for even more specials. So we promoted this contest and um, we said, here's where you can buy them if you want to buy them. And we followed up in this comment string at the end and said, congratulations to the winners. If you're interested in purchasing these t-shirts, if you didn't win, here's the link and here's a code for 10% off. So I think that that was a way to push a promotion. It was a sales promotion, but really focus on what Facebook users want, and they want free stuff. So I'm kind of being sarcastic but serious there. Uh, mistake, number, <laughs> mistake number six, you're ignoring me. If all you do is post to your page and never answer anyone's comments or questions, I'm going elsewhere. If I just wanted to read everything you're doing, I'd go to your website. So this is an example. If you go to our fan page, you'll see this, and I'm going to actually show it um, in a little bit. This person says, how old do you have to be to volunteer? We didn't just say, like, 16 and be done. We gave them a ton of resources. So we have these standardized responses that we give people. You know, my dog is lost. Where do I adopt a dog? Um, what do I do if I need to change my address labels, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but we add a personalized element into each one of them. So if, it could be as simple as just repeating their name. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Tom. Here's the answer to your question. But you can see, like, we went, into, we went all about this person's question. Um, and disclaimer, like, we have the resor resources to do that, but we also have a very large fan page. So our, in our resources increased um, with time and growth. So we answer everybody that comes into our page. Mistake number seven, you automate your posts. How many of you are doing this? How many of you automate your posts so that the same thing goes to Facebook and Twitter? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, no, it is not to put you on the spot. Um, it's, I'm going to tell you why this is a, it's a bad idea. If, you see, if, if I see you post on Facebook with a hashtag one more time, I'm going to unlike you. I'm not on Twitter. I don't get it. 
if you can't take the time to talk to me like a Facebook user, I'm going to find someone else who will. How many of you have seen people post to Facebook with Twitter hashtags in them and you're like, what is that? Or maybe you guys know what it is. But um, this is an example, Self Magazine. I love Self Magazine. I've been reading Self Magazine since I was a teenager. Um, but they have this, they, they auto post and it says, fun tip from at Toshiba. Here's a fun DIY citywide workout. Bitly link, pound, thrive, robo dance. What does that mean to a Facebook user? That is obviously you are too lazy to craft the message for the medium. And that's what we really need to be doing in social media is crafting the message for the medium. I do, and, I, and there are two reasons. One is because Facebook is starting to group these kind of posts. So you'll see like 10 people posted via Foursquare or 10 people posted via Hootsuite, and then your stuff gets completely hidden. If you're lucky enough to be the one that they feature, that's great. But they're starting to group based on how you post. So um, the, that's, you know, your message could be completely lost. But the other thing is that um, a lot of times these platforms don't allow you to like tag people like for a Facebook example you, you can't tag people through an, a, through a third-party system um, and it, it goes the same about it as posting the same thing on both places a lot of these platforms they're like save time and do one post and we'll post it to Facebook and Twitter and I just really I think that you really need to take the time to talk to people and, and customize the the post based on what platform you're on. Mistake number eight, I can't find you. If I'm trying to find you on Facebook and Twitter and you don't have the links on your website, you may never see me again. I prefer to communicate on those channels and I don't want to spend a lot of time looking. Like this is a total Facebook user attitude that I'm portraying here, but it's true. A lot of people now go to a company's website just to find the links to their Facebook or Twitter or whatever community they're on. And those links need to be prominent. So what we did was we, in our website redesign, we actually have live feeds of our Facebook and Twitter posts on the home page. And then in the footer, and that footer goes through the whole website, there's a link to our Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, and uh, we're getting ready to add Pinterest and Google+. Mistake number nine, I can't participate on your page. What? You disabled comments on your page? Again, if I wanted to just read, I would go to your website. You're defeating the entire purpose on Facebook by disabling features. So I want to quickly go to the best practice that in my opinion for large brands and brands that get a lot of interaction on Facebook. Split your Facebook page into post by you and post by everyone else. So when people post on your wall, and I think really think you should allow people to post on your page, but have it filtered off to that second tab. The caveat is you don't want to ignore that tab because when you click over to our everyone tab, it's very, very active. Um, see this, this, these posts, can you help us? This ungodly Idaho is passing these laws, blah, 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 you know? I'm proud of my, my team because they're responding very quickly here. Um, but again, you really need to pay attention. If you're going to allow comments on the, uh, your Facebook page and filter them, you need to make sure that you're monitoring this separate tab. But I do think it's a best practice. And I'm totally going to um, call out my competitors right now, the ASPCA. Um, they, do not allow com they do not allow people to post on their page. If you post here, it disappears. So it won't go on their wall and it won't go on a filtered tab. And I think this defeats the purpose of Facebook. It really does. People come to your page to interact with you and if you disable that, what you're going to get is people going elsewhere. So we get people from the ASPCA page all the time coming over to ours and saying, I couldn't post this on the ASPCA page, so I'm going to post it here um, and answer my question. Um, and No, they, they don't allow it at all. What they'll do is they will take their comment to the latest comment string that ASPCA posted, and it has nothing to do with the topic that they posted. So that's something that, that you'll have to deal with too, is if you don't allow people to post on your page, they'll post their comment on a comment string that has nothing to do with what you were talking about. 
I, yes, that could be it. And I, you know, I, I don't know. But I, but they are not. They are far from the only brand that does this. And so I really think that you need to allow people to express themselves, but monitor it and um, make sure that it's filtered off to a second area. The other thing about that is when somebody comes to your page for the first time. Let's be honest, you want them to see the great stuff that you're posting and the great stuff that you're doing. If you have an active page and you're allowing people to post to that page, their posts could push down your posts to the very end and then it's all this crazy nonsense about problems that people are having. And you don't want that to be your first in, uh, somebody's first impression of your brand. So that filtering, I think, is, is a, an important practice. Yes? Right. Is that yes, so every fan page needs to have a personal profile tied to it at, for, as an administrator. Um, and so my, my page is a personal profile. Our Humane Society is a Facebook fan page. So they're very different. Um, this is two tabs, I'll call them, on the fan page. They're just filtered. And that's done in your settings. Yeah. Yes. You um, we've talked a few times about you know, not automating and responding to things, responding quickly, um, things like that for a smaller business that doesn't have the resources to to monitor Twitter, Pinterest, uh, Google Plus, Facebook. Is it better to do one right and to always be responding to rather than trying to reach all the audiences yeah. by automating? Yeah, I. I do. I think it's best to do one, do it really well, and that should be the one where your constituents are, where they are the most. So it's probably going to be Facebook. For most industries, it is. Um, do that one, do it really well. Set reasonable standards for, for you. If you're a small business or nonprofit or whatever and you have one person, most have one person that's doing everything website, email, social media, all of that stuff. Take a couple hours out of every day and work your your you know do your social media stuff and set the expectations okay so our response time is two hours on uh, Facebook and a half hour on Twitter for you it may be a full 24 hour day and these are during business hours by the way um, a full half a full day on Facebook and a full day on on Twitter and and that makes sense because we have the resources to have that immediacy. But the, the point is, is that you can't ignore people completely. So you've got to find a way that, that makes it work for you. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think if you're not a user yourself and you want to um, to be in those spaces, you should do one of two things. One is collaborate with somebody that can teach you those things and get you interested in the platform and becoming a user, or or have somebody help you who is a diehard user. Um, it could be an intern. We went through this too. Our our first social media person was an intern. She didn't make any of the decisions but she offered advice and, and helped with the administrative stuff and all of that. And she would, like, I would, I actually would send her, you know, posts and be like, what do you think of this wording? And she'd be like, no, that's not how you talk to people, you know? Um, so, because, you know, I, when I was in college, there was no Facebook, um, but the college kids now, it's a part of their lives and they grew up with it. Some of them are like over it, but they still, it's a, it's a part of what they do, and so it's like ingrained in their culture. And so I had to be the user and learn, whereas there are a lot of people coming into the workforce now that it's a part. So I would try to find somebody um, that can work with you um, or really start getting into to it yourself. I know it's a lot of work. It really is. We don't use a tool like that because we have 
two Facebook admins and one person that helps run the affiliate pages and we have an admin on the in our different areas of the organization that monitors those pages um, I imagine like I don't know does anybody here use Hootsuite we don't use any social media management tools You could set your email. Well, you can set Facebook, but my nonprofit just got hacked and I had a woman take a picture of a boot and put it on her nonprofit. And you want to know when that kind of thing happens. <laughs> and before I got my email, and I was walking to my computer to remove it, and I got 27 text messages right. from other people who had already seen it. Right. So you, I want to know when someone posts. Right. And that's the other thing is that when you build a community like this, they will come to your defense and, and alert you when things are happening um, and your employees too if they're invested um, at times where you're just not as involved and so that's something that that we see happening over time too. And if your phone's blowing up, then you <laughs> and you know something's going on yeah. <laughs> okay um, mistake number 10 is I can't share your content I'm on your email list because I really care about one of your issues when I get your email, I can't share it on Facebook. You only give me the option to email my friends. Most of my friends don't even have personal email addresses anymore. That's true. So I guess we're done here. That's not the way you want to be perceived when people get your email. And it's really getting harder and harder to keep people on your email list now. And so you want to give them a reason to stay. And one of those reasons is that they can share your content with their friends and family the way that they share other things that they want to. So at the end of every email I mentioned, you'll see this share on Facebook, share on Twitter, forward to a friend. I would not get rid of the forward to a friend. Do not dismiss email just yet. Um, our email program brings in 80% of our online revenue still. Um, and so you don't want to throw everything out and just focus on social media. You want all of these things to work together. So here's a crazy stat. Average percent of people who click the like button and never ever visit the page again is 90%. So what that means is that people like your brand and they never come back to your page. So all that work you did on custom tabs and beautiful posts and all of that, they're probably not seeing that stuff. The way people see your content is in their news feed. And so that's why it's important for you to be really, really interesting. Um, Again, find a way to be relevant, interesting, concise, responsive, and provide value. One trick that we found is, does anybody notice when it's Valentine's Day or something like that, Facebook groups all the posts about Valentine's Day to the very top of your feed? Um, that's one thing we've been taking advantage of on holidays and around news events that are happening, is that we post about that topic, and then our stuff gets bumped up to the top. But make sure you're not just being like, happy Valentine's Day or something like that. Like you want to be authentic. Find a way to tie your content to what's going on in the world. Yes? We do. We see higher engagement in terms of comments and likes on posts that are about something that's going on currently. Yeah, and some people will do that. Um, but the, the thing is that it's bumping your content to the very top so you have, there's more of a chance that somebody will see it. Yeah, yeah, the birthday feature I think is saving a lot of friendships in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so I've told you guys what not to do, so here's what you should do. Here are some best practices of things that we've learned over the years that really work for us. The first is answer everyone. I mentioned everybody that comes into us via uh, Facebook or Twitter that has a legitimate concern or question gets an answer. And I say legitimate because there are people, trolls out there, people causing trouble, We've talked about them before, that they are just there to wreak havoc. Um, and so those people, they don't get an answer. Um, but people who, even people who disagree with us, if they do it politely, they, they don't violate our commenting policy, they will get a thoughtful response. Connect with your Uber fans. We, uh, there's a lot of buzz about having an influencer strategy out there. And what you want is to find the people that are that are really gung-ho about your brand and talking all this great stuff about you and bring them in and show them love. So what we do is we have this vo online volunteer program. They have a, their own Facebook group. Uh, we have somebody uh, from 
my team who participates and kind of corrals them and, and works with them. And they go out across the web and spread the good word of the organization because they love us so much. They're doing that anyway. And so it's important for us to say thank you and to bring them in and to, you know, reward them. So we don't just give them trinkets from our online store for doing these, these great things. We give them free tickets to our, con our, our conferences about animal welfare. We fly them out to special events like our Genesis Awards, which is basically the Oscars for the animals. Um, we give them a signed copy of, of our CEO's book, and these things really matter to them because they are those people who just love our organization so much. And those people are out there. You've just got to know where to find them. One way is look at people, look at repeat, like retweeters and repeat commenters on your page. Um, and connect with them. If you're a nonprofit and you're on Facebook Causes, Facebook Causes gives you a whole list of the people who donate to you the most, who uh, recruit the most people, and who take action the most. And that is a gold mine for finding people who really, really love your organization. The point is to find them and to bring them in and reward them and build relationships with them. Be a user yourself. We've talked about that in length and why that's important. Maintain a consistent voice. I think this is really important. For a long time, we structured our team by channel. So we had two people on Facebook, one person on Twitter, one person was uh, doing Pinterest and a couple of other things, Google Plus and all of that. Um, and finally, we said, you know what? Even though they're separate channels and separate audiences, we would really benefit from having one person be a community manager and manage all of those platforms. And that's because it, it maintains a consistent voice. That person has all of the, the talking points that are needed in all of those situations. They know what's going on and blowing up on Facebook. They know that they need to be prepared for it to happen on Twitter or vice versa. And so we are changing the way that we're structured and building this community manager role that will own all of our social media channels and maintain some branding and messaging consistency across all of them. Get fancy, steal ideas. This is one of my favorite campaigns, even though I am so against it now. Um, this is called light gating. Does anybody know what light gating is? Okay. So light gating is forcing somebody to like your page in order for them to see what's, what's on the page. Um, I hate this. I think it's really, really sleazy, but we do it. Um, we do it once a year, and that's for our end of year campaign because we offer a really great deal. Usually it's a $500 shopping spree to our online store, which is full of pet products. So we require the like uh, in order to unlock. It's a Black Friday exclusive. And you see a lot of companies, uh, retail companies, doing this for Black Friday because it's such a big retail holiday. Um, and so we've tried this a couple of times, and there's a coupon behind it. We only do this once a year. I really think you have to be careful with this technique, but I saw somebody else do it and I wanted to try it. So there's no harm in trying this kind of thing. One thing I want to give an example of too is an idea that I stole from somebody. This is why it's important to read blogs and things because you'll see case studies and get to steal ideas. This is a custom tab that we have on our Facebook page right now. And, and uh, how many of you have Facebook Timeline? Timeline is the new Facebook. You can get it. That Facebook will be forcing it on you at some point. Well, Timeline gives the, the, you the ability to present this beautiful photo at, across your page. Um, at, it's almost like a panoramic photo. So we started seeing people pr uh, pr providing these branded Timeline photo cover photos. So we were like, oh yeah, we, we definitely want to do that. Um, let's just slap our logo on this really cute puppy and call it a day. So we did that. <laughs> And, and then we were like, okay, that's cool and all, but everybody's doing it. What can we do to make it even better, to improve it for our brand awareness? So what we did was we added the ability to create your own. And basically, you choose your own photo from Facebook, and it puts us our, our stamp on it, and it says, it's our logo, and it says, proud supporter of the Humane Society of the United States, with a link, a, a, a URL to our Facebook page. So I could take a photo of my gorgeous dog and upload it here and put a stamp on it and says proud supporter of the Humane Society of the United States and use it as my Facebook timeline cover photo. Um, now, 
this does take some technical know-how, but you can make these things work for you based on your goals and the, the technical capabilities that you have. You just got to know where to look for these kind of ideas. And one of those ways is reading social media publications. Some of them do, yeah. I don't know how to do that. I mean, I'm not younger, but. <laughs> But I have really smart people. Um, the, the next point somewhat tied to this is provide exclusivity. Uh, a lot of brands are using like us on Facebook and get this. And Facebook users love that kind of deal. The challenge is, is keeping those people once you've gotten them to like you for a really great deal. And that's why it's important to follow those principles of answering everybody and providing fun content and listening to the kind of feedback that your people give you on the content that you do provide. An example of that is uh, one time our footage, our investigative footage, was featured in the show called Hoarders. Everybody familiar with that show? Um, it has a cult-like following, but it, not our fans, because when we post about it, they went off. They were like, I hate this show. This is not what animal welfare is about. All this stuff. It was the feedback we could have never have anticipated and so we said okay we'll never post about that show again so it's important to, to listen definitely listen to your fans play by the rules this is what I wanted to talk about about Facebook contests you cannot hold a contest on Facebook that says we will give a trip to our 1000th fan or like this post and you'll get a chance to enter and win this see a lot of businesses doing this and this is against Facebook's promotional rules now there's a chance that you might not get caught but really you want to play by their rules and not have take the risk of having them wipe your promotion completely and then you're embarrassed um, and then everybody that entered was like what happened um, and, and it could cause some some ruckus so you really want to play by Facebook's rules know the promotional guidelines if you're going to be doing a giveaway or something like that the way we get around this is Facebook says if you use a third party application that's approved by Facebook to disseminate your contest, and I'm talking about a giveaway, a sweepstakes, an essay contest, anything like that, um, then you're fine because those approved third party applications know what to ask you and what to make you, you abide by the rules. The one we like if you're interested in doing contests is Wildfire. Um, it is really easy, really user-friendly, and covers all the bases. Um, so we don't do them very often, but when you do do them, like you've got to have contest rules and all this stuff. So, um, so make sure that you're not just doing these rogue giveaway kind of things on Facebook. On Twitter, you can do whatever you want. So we usually give stuff away on Twitter. Yes. No, because Facebook cannot be the way to enter in order to get whatever product it is. That's what it says in their promotional guidelines. So that would not be okay, actually. Yeah. Un yeah, that's true. Create your own memes. This is one of my favorite tactics and one that really works well for us. Um, everybody on Twitter know what Follow Friday is? You tell people, your favorite people to follow and, and build relationships that way. Well, we have Feline Friday. So Feline Friday is the chance to send us your adorable cat photos, and that's all it is. And then we retweet some of our favorites. Sometimes we'll throw in some messaging. If you're having problems with your cat using the litter box, watch our video, Feline Friday. Um, but most of the time, it's retweeting adorable photos of cats that people, our supporters, have sent in to us. We also do Mutt Monday for the, uh, for the dog lovers. And then we, we cut it off at there because if we did like gerbils and, and hamsters and all that, like we'd never have any days left. So we do Mutt Monday and Feline Friday. But, and those work really well on Twitter. What we also do is Take Action Tuesday on Facebook because we know that our people on Facebook want to make a difference and they want to know what they can do to help animals. When we ask them what are your favorite kinds of posts and we do that pretty regularly to make sure that we know what people like, they always say the ability to take action or to do something. So we created this meme on, on Facebook called Take Action Tuesday. So every Tuesday you come to our page you'll have a chance to make a difference by taking action. Bonus, we get your email address and then you're, you're on our email file. 
Um, so when we don't do it, people complain. Whatever happened to Take Action Tuesday? I like being able to participate more. So that's the thing. If you create these memes, you got to stick with them. Plan it out, but be flexible. We have an editorial calendar for Facebook posts. And that's because there's a lot of competition in our organization to promote people's content. We work on, you know, a hundred different campaigns and, and I've got to decide what's a priority and what our audience likes the most. So we have this editorial calendar and, and, and we plan out all of our posts, but things happen. Um, recently, a man's cat got euthanized on accident when he brought it into a shelter to get receive care. And our post that day wasn't about the Spay Day Pet Photo Contest. Um, we didn't post about anything because we were too busy dealing with that crisis. And so um, you've really got to be flexible even though having a plan is, I think, a good idea. And we use that, it's just an Outlook calendar, by the way. So This is an example of participating elsewhere as your page. Uh, who's on Foursquare? Anybody? Cool. Okay. So Foursquare wrote, we won four Webby Awards. Here's the five-word acceptance speech from our CEO. Every check-in saves a kitten. So I go into and I log in as the Humane Society of the United States so I could post as the Humane Society and I said, oh really? So um, we wrote to them, they saw that and they called our business development department the next day and said, we would love to work with you. And that was big for me because I, you know, I'm, I'm a social media geek and, and it's Foursquare. So that simple act of participating as the Humane Society on their page brought a potential uh, partnership. Don't be so serious all the time. I think everyone understands why that's important. Um, people are on Facebook because it's fun. So you don't want to be so serious. Our mission is celebrating animals and confronting cruelty. We honestly push the celebrating animals stuff more on Facebook because it's an upbeat community. And then when we do push the, the cruelty alerts, like we want you to take action on this horrible case, People don't see that so much, so they're not so jaded by it. Has anybody seen our commercials? Really sad? Sad music, sad puppies? We get complaints about them all the time on Facebook and Twitter because they're too sad. So, um, so it's important not to be so serious all the time. So you guys are laughing because you know what I'm talking about because you probably changed the channel, don't you? Turn the sound off. Exactly. Okay. Um, make real world events social. So this is the registration form for our yearly conference. And what we did was we added a field in the registration process that said, are you on Twitter? Tell us your Twitter handle. This was simple to do on the technical side. I don't know how to do it, but, but they were able to do it pretty simply. What they do is they export that list and send it to me so that I can go and follow those people and talk, start a conversation with them about the conference. Because if you're going to the conference and you're on Twitter, we absolutely want to connect with you and not wait until we see you something post after you've been at the conference for two days. Be timely, it's another thing I was mentioning, like talking about current events and things like that, but really um, the important thing is to capitalize on things that are happening in the news and the media and the world. If it relates to what you're working on, your business, your nonprofit, whatever it may be, and really just capitalize on that because the more relevant you can be on Facebook, the more attention you're going to get. Ask for input. Um, Another thing we do on Fridays is we always do something fun, what I consider fun. So, um, so we ask a question, we do a poll, we post a cute photo, a funny video, um, we do a fill in the blank, tell us your pet's funniest habit, all of those things. Um, and so this time, this Friday, we did, are you participating in Take Your Dog to Work Day on Friday, June 24th? Lucky for me, every day is Take Your Dog to Work Day, which is one of the responses up here. Um, but we just ask people for their opinion. We may never do anything with this data, but people love to give their opinions. Um, and, so, and, and, and not just their opinions, but, but answer a question. Um, and so every Friday is reserved for that kind of feedback. Sometimes we'll use the data and sometimes we won't. Sometimes it's just for fun. Use photos and video. I mentioned breaking up your content um, so that it's not just text. Use those, those photos and videos. They do not have to be professional quality to be acceptable on Facebook and Twitter. In fact, in my opinion, things like Instagram and YouTube have lowered the expectations of quality 
in photos. Now that's bad news maybe for some people, but great news for somebody like me because I can take a picture with my iPhone and it's perfectly acceptable. So um, make sure that you're, you're taking advantage of the fact that anybody can take a photo with their phone nowadays and, um, and, and record video the same way too. Close the loop. This is a really big thing for us because we're a nonprofit. Basically, um, two years ago, we were involved in the Pepsi Refresh Project. Was a it was a, um, a competition by Pepsi. They were giving money to charities. Basically, we were in the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar category, so we had the chance to get that money for our animal rescue team. And again, we had to go through and get our people to vote for us, and it was very intense. You had to vote every day, and the tallies were were tallied every day and it was a, it was a, logistically a nightmare but it was all worth it in the end because we won the money and we pushed this on Facebook really hard because that's where we felt most people would respond to those asks um, and so we said yeah we won but then after that we did this post that said did you vote for us in the Pepsi refresh project see how the grant money we received thanks to your votes is being put to use in this recent rescue of nearly 700 cats um, and so that closes the loop with these people they may be donors they may just have voted or whatever but they know that what they're doing is making a difference make it a safe place even if you don't post every day, come to your page every day to manage it. Have a commenting policy. So I'm going to show you guys our commenting policy. Um, it's in our company overview on our info tab. So it starts out um, by just giving an overview of who we are. It says, um, this page is a, is, is a page for supporters of the HSUS, and we encourage open discussion and invite you to share your opinions on our issues. By participating on this page, you're agreeing to our commenting policy outlined below. We reserve the right to delete posts on our page containing any of the following elements. That is, profanity, misinformation, spam, off-topic or irrelevant posts, personal attacks, anything promoting violence, promoting illegal or questionable activities, because that does happen on our page, and then there were two ones that we, edit, we added recently based on problems that we were having in our community. The first is rallying on behalf of people or organizations which support animal abuse. We have a very, very big problem with opposition. Everybody's like, oh my God, who hates the Humane Society? Those people are out there and they're socially savvy and they're trying to attack our brand. And so we're not going to tolerate people saying, you know, directing people to our opposition's content because it's not factual, first of all. Um, and so we added that. And then the next thing we just added last week, we are seeing an influx of people posting vid uh, uh, photos of abused animals on our page. You may have seen friends saying, share this photo and, and um, let's track these people down. The problem with that is that it makes it even harder to track those people down when it's shared so many times and copied so many times. So we added that to our commenting policy that says, circulation of photos which depict animal cruelty. Sharing these photos across the internet does more harm than good because it makes it track harder to track down the originator. If you have information about a photo depicting animal cruelty, please email us instead or call. Um, Facebook is not the place for that kind of stuff. So um, that was a problem that, we, and, and Amanda said it in the, in the last session too, constantly be revising your, and, and evaluating your commenting policy so that it protects you and addresses issues that you have. Um, an example of this recently was in California, a prominent figure in California took a picture of this mountain lion that he shot and held it up. It was dead. He did it in another state because that's illegal. Trophy hunting, I believe, is illegal in California where he lives. He did it in another state. He's holding up this, it's an awful photo. Um, and he's proud about it. And so we've been posting about this saying that this is wrong. Um, we want people to take action, all of that, across all of our different channels. And we're monitoring the comments and the commenting policies protecting us from profanity and personal attacks. Our supporters are very, very um, passionate. And so they say mean things about other people. Even if we are against that person, we're not going to tolerate that. We can't have that on our page. When you don't have a commenting policy, this is what happens. Um, this is the Mountain Lion Foundation's Facebook page, and I'm not, I know some of you can't read it. I'm not going to read it out loud because it's full of profanity, but this is awful, and you can't let this happen on your page. 
um, all this profanity, these personal attacks against this guy, even though we are against what he is doing, we cannot, we have a nonviolence policy, and so we cannot have that kind of thing happen. Um, this poor Facebook page is happening. So um, that's why you have a commenting policy, and that's why you enforce it. Pay attention to feedback. I mentioned the hoarders uh, situation. If you do a post and people don't like it, you really want to evaluate why and if you should do that again. And just listen to what your people are saying. Um, I hate to talk about it because it was very dark time, but when we decided to uh, work with Michael Vick after what he did, our community revolted against us, and it was a four-alarm PR crisis. Um, what people didn't understand is they were not the audience that, of why we were working with him. The audience was kids and preventing them from dogfighting. Um, but that was not very easy to tell people. And so, um, you know, we shared all of that feedback with the people who make the decisions in the organization because all the, they weren't hearing anything. They were just putting out the PSAs and he was doing great talking to kids and changing the way and they were listening to him and all of that. They don't see any of the stuff that happens on Facebook that we see. So it's important to pay attention to that feedback and relay it to the decision makers. Make friends and cross promote. Um, we have a lot of our different business development uh, contracts and, and, and partners and all of that. We should absolutely be liking them on Facebook and, and having a conversation with them because we're partners with them in real life. So I think we should be partners with them on Facebook too and, and build those, um, those relationships. Um, so if you've made some of these mistakes and not doing any of these best practices, I really don't think it's too late. The biggest thing about social media is it really is still very new, and you can learn from those mistakes and move on. This is my favorite quote. It's not my quote, but I'm stealing it. Um, it says, you may not have time for social media, but social media has plenty of time for you. Um, he said your org, but it could be said for anybody. So think about that. You know, it, it's... I know that a lot of people don't have the kind of resources that larger organizations do and they're doing 10 million things, um, but it is important to carve at least a little bit of time out to pay attention to this because social media is not a fad. Social media is changing the way that people communicate. Um, and I don't think it's going anywhere, it's just going to keep evolving. So um, that is my presentation. Thank you guys for your attention.